Left for Dead by Steve Loins. The war on Prius Momentius was over. Hive Optis had been pried from the claws of depravity. Thank the Emperor! Blessed order had been finally restored. The Austro Militarum could claim the victory. The local militia, chronically undermanned, had misjudged the spread of corruption. It had overtaken and overwhelmed them, forcing them to transmit an astropathic distress call. A Death Corps of Krieg regiment had arrived to take control, and for a full month, day and night, the sky had flashed with thundered to relentless beat of their siege gun. The city's walls had shuddered and execrably crumbled. Its decadent captors had been put to the flight, and then most of them to the sword. The corpsmen had departed with other wars on the other worlds to fight. Silence had settled in their wake. Only long enough for the Emperor's loyal subjects to breathe a collective prayer for relief. And the real work had begun. The sky now resounded with the roars of construction vehicles and shattered debris of habs and factorums groaned beneath the weight of caterpillar tracks. The glit edge finery of the city's cathedrals reduced of fragments were shallowed away by claw blades. Exposed guts of great mining machines spat and hissed and touched off fires. Yavrin was a corporal on the Prius Interior Guard. He was new to the rank since his predecessor had been captured and butchered by the enemy, and was eager to prove himself. He had charge of a labor gang of the thousands, under a hundred weary and traumatized civilians charged with shifting through the wreckage, recovering what they could. Whip-wielding servitors stood over them, encouraging them in these duties. Thus it was Corporal Yavrin's encounter the stranger. His labor gang was dragging bodies from a fallen had block. They had found a number of survivors yesterday. Not quite so many today. Tomorrow they would be reassigned to a higher priority area. Power has yet to be restored to the hive sector. Three standing lumen units coughed and sputtered out sprays of pale white light, between which lurked brooding shadows. Yavrin turned his head to the just that moment to see a shape flitting through those shadows, one with no right to be there. He snapped up his rifle with a flashlight attachment, pinpointing the figure of the man. His skin was pale, as with any lower hive-level dweller, deprived of direct sunlight. He was young and weary, with a military buzz cut. Yavrin's eyes were immediately drawn to the lasgun in his hand. Though, the stranger wasn't aiming it. Drop the weapon! Drop it! On your knees! Lance, place your hands behind your head! The stranger complied with each instruction in turn. Identify yourself! The corporal demanded. The stranger didn't answer. He knelt, staring at Yavrin with dulled eyes, unblinking. Everyone thought he might be a soldier, yet the build and bearing of one, but no uniform. He wore a set of shapeless grey coveralls, singed, tattered with soot. Identify yourself, repeated Yavrin. Name and rank. I don't remember, said the stranger, the words catching in his throat. Drawing closer, Yavin saw the stranger's head was cut. Blood had crusted around the wound and stripped his cheek. He was probably concussed. The corporal mentioned to the nearest laborers. He hadn't bothered to remember their names or faces. He sent three of them to strip the stranger and search him. He didn't resist. One laborer brought the stranger's weapon to Yavin. At a glance, he could see that it wasn't Prius' issue. He had seen enough like it in the recent weeks, however. The last gun was modified to fire a more powerful shot, but at a cost. Extra sink rings had been fitted around the barrel to bleed off excess heat. It bore the stamp of the Imperial Forges on Lucius. 
which made it Krieg property. Where did you get this? The stranger didn't answer him. His eyes remained fixed upon Yevren as the laborers ran calloused hands over him, searching for tattoos or mutation. It reported that the stranger was clean, and one of them had found his ident papers. At the corporal's impatient urging, he read out the details. His name is... Uh, Avro, sir. Registered to... This sector. He's a menial. Third grade. Yevon was almost disappointed. So much fuss, he thought, for a maintenance dredge. He must have taken the last gun from a fallen trooper. Likely had no idea how to use it. Evan was inclined to shoot him on the spot and save the Medicaid's team the effort. He lowered his rifle instead, crouching to inspect the stranger's eyes. Clear enough, he judged. He straightened up, beckoning to his laborers again. Take him to the Medicaid and be swift about it. Back in twenty minutes or I'll have you both flogged. More than enough time had been wasted on destruction. He had no intention of missing his end of the shift quota. The stranger had been hauled out of Corporal Yevren's sight and, almost as quickly, faded from his thoughts. The Medicaid facility was no quieter than anywhere else. The air buzzed with urgent shouts, rushing footsteps and howls and screams of dying gurgles of the untended, wounded. In fact, the word facility over-dignified this place, a makeshift camp strewn between the cranes and hoist of a broken-down factorum. A hundred dredges scrubbed the walls, gradually eroding centuries of ingrained soot. The mops swirled fresh of vomit and blood around the floor. Haggard medics stumbled between them, red-eyed and disheveled, urgent pleas pulling them in all directions. The man known as Avril was dumped on a creaking gurney. He lay on his back and let the clamor wash over him. It merged with the ringing in his head to deny him the sleep he sorely needed. He breathed in the stench of the infected and diseased bodies. Occasionally he slipped into a fitful doze, bewoken by a gunshot. For many of his fellow patients, it appeared a bullet to the brain was the most effective treatment. For hours, only two people showed ever any attention. The first was an administratum clerk who checked his papers, tapped his details into a data slate, clicked his tongue to himself, and moved away. The second was a middle-aged woman, dripping piously with religious symbols, who searched them as the laborers had at the hab block. The signs of chaos corruption. In between these interruptions, his mind fled to the recent past. Five Optus had been split open, its cannon silenced. The death corps had risen from their trenches and surged forward. They were strafed with small arms fire, to no avail. For every skull mask figure cut down, two more appeared to replace them. Their advance continued, unstoppable. A tidal wave of screaming madness. The enemies were worshippers of excess, wanton relievers and carnal pleasure. They possessed not a fraction of the corpsman's iron discipline. In the face of the Emperor's holy vigilance, they broke. Holes gaped open in the cultist masses, into which the corpsmen poured and widened them with guns, combat knives, and the stretch of their own sinews. Evro's head rang with each beat of the battle. His ears had been dreadened. His eyes flashed blinded by bursting grenades. The stink of blood and fire, chlorite and death, assaulted his nostrils. He lay on his stomach in the dirt, pinned down. Blood crawled, hot and sticky, down in the right cheek. His vision was beginning to clear, though it still burned. Shapes shifted around him. They were thickening smoke haze. He must have briefly lost consciousness at the battlefront, passed over him. Death corpsmen surrounded him, encased his flak armor and heavy greycoats. Their boots, 
pulverized debris beside his head. How inhuman they look, he thought. Their faces concealed behind with breather masks so that even their eyes were hidden. From this lowly vantage point, he couldn't tell one from the other. He must have seen him. In turn, but no one came to help him. Why would they? He was nothing but a stranger to them, too. And each corpsman was looking for a clear shot at the enemy. Though the crash of his comrades before him. Following an imperative drilled into him from birth. Pushing forward. Ever forward. In minutes, hours, or days had passed. They were gone. Ever barely remembered dragging himself to his feet, throwing off the hunks of masonry that had piled up on his back. He found himself for the very first time in his life, alone. He had clung to his lasgun throughout the ordeal, so hard the fingers of his right hand had seized up around the trigger guard. His mask had been knocked askew. The rebreather unit on his chest was dented and inoperative. He shucked off his coat and discarded his broken equipment. The air was unpleasant, but at least it wasn't toxic. Like the air of his birth world. Not like Krieg. The men, who had been known as Avro, held his mask in his gloved hand. He stared at the reflection, a face he didn't recognize. It's blank, skull eye sockets. An unfamiliar thought, an unworthy thought, occurred to him. He was free. Evero was yanked back to the present, and to his makeshift sickbed. Medicae squinted at him through an augmented eyepiece. He clicked his fingers at the servitor, which tundled over. It brought up a heavy, hyperdemic arm, inside which serum-filled tubes cycled into one, locked into place. The servitor thrust a huge needle into Evero's stomach, and a chemical Bolt dulled his pain, tiredness, and sharpened his mind. Discharged, the medica grunted, turning away from him. Evo called after him. No, wait, where do I go? No further treatment necessary. Discharged. The medica hovered over another patient, presenting his back to Evro. The recovery impossible. Termination advised, pronounced in this case. Don. Ever climbed off the gurney. The moment his feet touched the floor, a pair of dredges deposited an unconscious woman in his place. Their downcast eyes avoided his, and he chose not to question them. He was weary of asking too many questions. He took his papers, rather, Ever's papers, his pocket, and found an address on them. A herb. It wasn't clear. He had never known such a thing. Other discharge patients were joining a line. It stretched from the desk at which a middle-aged man worked unhurringly. Ever followed the line out of the building, halfway around a city block. He eavesdropped as someone else asked what the line was for, and was told habitation and labor assignment. He took his place at the back of the line and waited. He spoke only once, when someone behind him grumbled that his sprained ankle hadn't been bandaged. The Emperor gives us all we need, snapped Avro, and resources must be managed. He regretted abandoning his depleted medikit along with his uniform. He could have sterilized his head wound. Name and ident number, asked the desk clerk three hours later. He thumbed a data slate, nodding occasionally to himself. Ever waited, half expecting the clerk to uncover his deception as soon as he looked up and saw his face. Your hab sector had been condemned. <laughs> I see. I'm assigning you to a shelter in the Labor King. The clerk took the stab of a pencil to Ava's papers, made it entailized some amendments, and slid them back across the desk. He didn't glance at Evo at all. Checking his wrist chrono, he said, Your first work shift begins at 2600 hours. 
The time now is 2418. Next! Public vehicles were leaving the Medica camp all the time, dispersing ex-patients across the sprawling multi-layered city. Now Evo knew what was expected of him. He acted accordingly. Among the bleary-eyed crowd, he located six others bound for his sector, an interior guard, ground car, and driver to take them there. Evo rode on the fender as they snaked their way through the burning industrial blocks and around impassable thoroughfares. He drank in the sounds, sights, and smells of the world unlike he had ever seen before. A world that few of his kind would ever see. Broken world, for sure. But a world, the moment, at peace. Avril's new world. The girl watched Avril for four days before she dared approach him. Her labor gang, now his gang too, was evacuating a collapsed grain store. The interior guard overseer had impressed upon them the import of this task. Emergency supplies had been requested from the closest agri-world, but thousands could starve waiting for them. Aero had one of the larger tools, pickaxe. He was shattering the biggest, most impractical hunks of debris so that others could scoop them up with their shovels. The girl had a shovel and worked her way closer to him. As soon as she was allowed, she took a beaker of water to him. Hello, she said. My name is Zane. He responded with a disinterest grunt. He swung his axe, shattered stone, after the X again. He didn't take the water from him. He had rarely seen ever talking to anyone else. This had been by choice to begin with, having been rebuffed. However, his fellow laborers now tended to shun him. Your name is Evro? Zane pestered. I heard the overseer say so. Yes. He allowed. My name is Evro. And you're from the Hap Sector, Kappa 2 Phi. I used to live there. Evro swung his axe. Shattered stone. Hefted the axe again. How did you get so strong? This question phased him, just a little, interrupting his rhythm. I think you're the strongest in our gang, Zane told him. He was, in fact, easily the best and most tireless worker among them. She didn't think the servitors had ever had to whip him. The others often talked about him in resentful tones because he made them look idle, more deserving of the lash in comparison. The work is good. Evo grunted. Zane was surprised. You enjoy it? It is good to build. To improve things rather than destroy them. She considered that statement. Chewing on her lower lip. Yes. She agreed at length. I suppose it is. A servitor wheeled its ponderous frame their way. Quickly, Zane dropped to her knees and began to shovel again. She set Avril's beaker down beside him. You should drink it, she insisted. You don't know when there'll be more. This is good water, too. Hardly any slime in it. Some days there's none at all. Avril looked at her for the first time. How old are you? Eleven, said Zane proudly. Ten and three quarters, really, but I've been looking after myself since I was six. What happened to you? He struggled to find the right word. My parents. I don't remember my dad. He died when I was a little girl. They said it was a monster that got loose in the mines. Then mom was ill and I had to look after her. I had to work to earn food for us to eat. But she died too. The illness took her. Zane shook her head. The cultist then. She was in our hab block when it collapsed. The blasphemers were hiding in there, you see. So the soldiers had to. Avril's eyes narrowed. The muscle on his cheek twitched. The soldiers killed her. They had no choice. They had to stop the blasphemers. For the Emperor. Zane spoke in a perfectly matter-of-fact tone. 
as if relating something she had read in a book. Her life, she had always been taught, was what it was, and there was no point being sad about that. Self-pity, in fact, was the very worst kind of ingratitude. She was almost grateful for the hard work, too. It kept her mind busy. Ever pushed his untouched beaker towards her. Yeah, he said. Drink it. He didn't have to offer twice. Zane downed the quenching water in one gulp. The servitor, it transpired, was still watching her. She felt its lash across her shoulders for taking more than her share, but it was worth it. What was one more stripe to add to all the others? She wiped her lips on her filthy, ragged sleeve. I didn't mean to get you in trouble, Ever mumbled, once the servitor's attention was safely elsewhere again. Wasn't your fault, Zane assured him. We have our orders, said Ever stiffly, and we must follow them. Between work shifts, they ate, slept, and did little else. Alongside a thousand others in a designated refugee shelter. The building had been a chapel, but was desecrated beyond hope of salvation. Wooden pews had been hacked to pieces, stained glass windows shattered. Blood and feces had been scrubbed from the walls, but had left a lingering, pungent scent. With the outlines of spray painted blasphemies, Endured. Neville collected his ration of gruel that night and, as always, consumed it sitting cross legged on his blanket. Tonight, for the first time, someone joined him. He didn't object to Zane's presence, though. Again, it was left to her to break the silence. Do you have a family? she asked him. Neville shook his head. But, never! You must have! There must be someone. Everyone has a mom and dad. Even if they never... Ever interrupted her angrily. I have no one. Nothing. Just a... He checked himself, as if regretting his candor. He sighed. I do not belong here. They longed to ask what he meant by that. She had had her first glimpse behind the stranger's facade, however and feared what else she might unleash. She summoned her courage anyway. She had never met anyone unlike herself before. She wanted to know everything about him. But as she opened her mouth, the moment was stolen. A howl of rage and panic yelling emerged from one of the tra transips. Ever was on his feet before Zane had seen him move. His ball clattered to the tired floor, spilling its contents. Zan, too, was brushed aside, while others gasped and cowered, too weary and afraid to act. Ever waded through them. Zane began to follow him, but stopped, suddenly afraid. A man burst from the transept, gangly, half-dressed and dirty, wide-eyed with straggly, lice-infected beard. He screamed in a way that Zane had seen few times before, like a man possessed scattering those around him with the force of his insanity. A few braver souls tried to catch him, struggling for a grip on his sinewy arms and legs, tearing his once white shift. They and many others shouted warnings, prayers, or just shouted mindlessly, afraid. Their voices crashed into each other so that only the fear was communicated, spreading like wildfire. Neville stepped confidently into the madman's path. His hand lashed out like a python. There was a crack of bone. The madman was abruptly silenced. He collapsed to the floor, his eyes rolling back into his head. And the fear subsides. Though the crash of the voices did not, overseers in the chapel were only beginning to react to the disturbance. Pushing through a newly enraged crowd, the madman, though certainly dead, was punched and kicked and spat on. Everyone was keen to offer their version of events. Zane made out some of the details therein. Shrieking his duties? More than his share of water. 
muttered something that sounded like only mouthing the words of the prayer, hiding something on his shoulder like a tattoo or... Evro shank from the center of attention, reappearing at Zane's side. No one appeared to notice him. For all that he had done, his part had been played in the blink of an eye and retreated back into anonymity. The overseer shiftly concluded their investigations, didn't bother to inspect the madman's body, but picked out two laborers at random and instructed them to dispose of it. Funeral pyres had been burning across the city for weeks. This was just a little more fuel for the closest of them. How did you know? Zane asked Avril. How did you know what to do? Decisive action was required. He stated flatly. Yes, but how did you know that what they were saying about the man was true? Did you hear or see something? Or... Zane turned to a newfound friend and saw the truth in the dull gray eye. Her voice trailed off. I understand. I understand. Zane told him. It was half an hour later and most of the Lumen units had been shut off. Tired refugees hunkered down on the cold tiles, wrapped in their Therobear blankets, some of them exhausted by the day's trivials and needing to replenish their strength for tomorrow, were already snoring. I've been thinking about it, said Zane, keeping her voice low in difference to the slumbering mounds around her. And I really do. I understand. Avro grunted. He had poured his water ration into his bowl and was bathing his head wound with it. Once he was done, he put the bowl to his lips and drained it. You saw how everyone was starting to panic and you had to do something to stop it. If you hadn't, things could have been much worse. People could have been trampled and that man probably did something to deserve it. Anyway, one life for many more, it seemed. Reasonable equation. At least to those who knew how Capetius death and the will of the Emperor could be. The saying that a group of cults is hid in the shelter in Sector Eta 2 something, Dane whispered. During the night, they took out the knives and they went around slitting the throats of. Ever placed a hand on Zane. Fetch your blanket, he said gruffly. Crowded though the chapel was, there was some space around him. No one wanted to get too close. The girl's face lit up. She hurried off to do as she was told. By the time she returned, Ever was asleep. In his dream, round, paralyzed, hopeless. The soldiers in Skull Mask were being blasted to pieces around him. He knew he shouldn't care. For every one that died, two more appeared to replace him. There was no stopping them. Yet, somehow, in the garbled world of the dream, every Skull Masked soldier was him. The dream disturbed him, yet oddly it brought him comfort too. When the waking bells wrenched him back to consciousness and he remembered where he was, the knot tightened in the pit of his stomach. The dream, at least, had been a familiar world. He had known his place there, known his duty, and there had been others, many millions of others like him. In the waking world, this world at peace, he found himself lost. Overseers were on the move, encouraging the slow to rouse. Avo located Zane and nudged her with his toe, sparing her the lash. Stay close to me today, he whispered. He could already hear the clatter of the ladies. Depositing grey slop and tin bowls, he couldn't tarry if he wished to eat. There was rarely enough for everyone. Artificial hive light streamed through the broken windows, catching shards of colored glass and diffusing into rainbows. 
Another day stretched out to hit its Avro. Another long, hard-working day. It wasn't the work that made him feel weary, however. Ever was wearied by the effort of pretending to be an ordinary imperial citizen. When he hardly knew what that meant. Attention, Attention all, citizens. all citizens. A voice blared out from Vox speakers across the sector. Evan was expected to heed its words without pausing in their labors. It occurred to Zane that after all the devastation, the speakers had been the first things restored. Which was only right, of course. Communication was vital, and the morning bulletins delivered good news to lift the spirits. Today, for example, there had been great victory on Orith, as the Emperor's angels descended from the skies to cleanse that world of pestilence. There was also a warning about diehard cultist cells in hiding across Hive Optis. A spy was uncovered in the refugee only last night, scheming to sabotage our reconstruction efforts. It was by the Emperor's grace and through the vigilance of ordinary citizens and such as yourself that his vile plot was foiled. Zane had no shovel today. Have been late in line for tools. She had to dig with her hands. There's no excuse for slacking. Private Rain was oversee. He was a little more mindful of Zane's young age than most. He let her take water to the other laborers, a drink without leaving the post. She found Avro kneeling, cradling something in his lap. He had laid down his axe. Zane crouched beside him, concerned that he might be hurt. He saw what he was holding. It was a mask. A gas mask with a hole for the rebeaver tube. One of its round eyepieces had been shattered, and the cloth was stiff with dried blood. Neville had half uncovered a fallen man. Zane had noticed the body, paid no heed. It was just one of many, very many. It seemed to have affected her friend, however. The dead man's right eye was a mess. Zane recognized the bullet wound by now. Knew it would have been instantly fatal. Avril must have peeled the gas mask from the corpse. What was it about this one in particular that had made his eyes glaze over? Did you know him? She asked. Avril hesitated. In a way, he confessed. He isn't wearing anything. The quartermasters must have reached him before he was buried. She frowned at the unfamiliar word. Quartermasters? They salvaged his weapon, his armor, his equipment. Ever turned his mask over in his hands. They only left this behind because it was broken beyond repair. It served its purpose and is useless to them now. Just like its owner. Who was he? asked Zane. One of our liberators. The Ostra Militarum? Zane had thought she'd never seen an Imperial Guardsman before. She now realized that she had seen plenty in recent days. She had just never seen one alive. Much had been rumored about the implacable, faceless soldiers of the Death Corps of Krieg. The threat of their fearsome armor. They looked like anyone else. Any casualty of war. Why did Orth merit angels? Prius had to make do with ordinary men. Praise the Emperor for the sacrifice. She mimicked the morning bulletin. They are bred to fight. Die for him. Avril murmured. They believe their lives are worth less than other lives. This man had nothing but his duty. He was glad to take a bullet in the eye, so that we could. We could. Could be free, said Zane. Yes, said Avril dully, so we could be free. He had rested too long. The whip servitor sprang up behind them, the muscles on its overdeveloped shoulders cording. 
The lash that replaced its right arm struck at Avil's back, cracking with a mild electric charge for good measure. Avil accepted his punishment with hardly a wince. He dropped the blood-encrusted mask and retook his pickaxe. Only Zane heard the bitter words he muttered to himself as he resumed his toil. Redoubled efforts. So we could be free. They achieved a breakthrough later that afternoon. The laborers cleared away into a storage cellar. Private Rain shone illuminated down there and announced that it appeared intact. He sent a dozen laborers down into the darkness at once. Zane would gladly have been one of them and was small enough to fit. Avro held her back with a shake of his head. For the next few hours, bulging grain sacks were hauled up from the cellar Passed along a line of workers, loaded into waiting trucks. One boy was whipped and sent it when a sack tore on his arms, disgorging its load. Zane was among those who had to kneel and claw back what they could from the dirt. They worked an extra hour, so flushed was Zane with their success. By the end of it, the cellar was almost picked clean. Then a woman in the entranceway lost her footing with the full sack in her hands. Her flailing hand snatched at the creaking, groaning rafter for support, and the whole world shifted. A terrible roar pierced Zane's ears. She thought they might be bleeding. She found herself hugging the ground, choking on black dust, blinded by tears. She came to realize only gradually that the shaking had stopped. As her eardrums cleared, she heard coughs and sputters. Wails of pain and cracked feeble cries for help. Zane's first thought was to get back to work before a servitor saw her. She made it to her knees before doubling over, hacking up dust and bile. There were bodies strewn about her. Some were twitching, some ominously still. Others struggled to escape from beneath fresh mounds of wreckage. It's all right. She heard a familiar voice in her ear. A strong arm encircled her shoulders. It's over. You're safe. Ever had produced a beaker of water from somewhere. Probably his own ration. She accepted it gratefully. All the... All those people... She stammered, trembling with shock. Ever shook his head. We can do nothing for them. You stopped me from going down there. You knew the cellar was unsafe. You could have... Why didn't you say something? The overseers saw what I saw. Ava assured her. They knew what I knew. It's not for us to question their decisions. The weary trudge back to the shelter that night was made under a heavier pole of silence than usual. As the workers filed through the chapel doors, Private Rain joined a small group of his comrades outside. He boasted to them about his successful day about the amount of food he had recovered. Inside the chapel, there was no sign of extra food, just fewer mouths to eat it. The little gruel remained was lukewarm, starting to congeal. Zane was too tired to feel hungry anyway. She went straight to bed. Despite her gang's extended shift today, work would resume exactly on schedule tomorrow. I heard something today said Zane. From someone at the refugee. The, his labor gang found another soldier. A death corpse of Krieger. Alive. Avil shook his head. No. Oh. You're not. Protest Zane. Although she had in fact been lying. The quartermasters count every corpsman back into the dropships. But what if... Only the dead are left behind. Or the missing, presumed dead. Yes, but what if one of the... A survivor would make himself known to the planetary authorities and arrange return to his company as soon as possible, else be a deserter. They were trampling through the streets of the hive. The gang was being herded into its new assignment, which was further away from the old one. This gave them half an hour's respite each morning, before real work started. Zane, like the overseers, tolerated some talking, 
as long as their charges walked. What would happen then? She asked. To a deserter? He didn't answer. Zane studied his face for a cue to what he was thinking, but found none. You said, she prompted him, that the Kriegers were bred to be soldiers. For corpsmen to display orders, Avril murmured. She had to strain to hear him. It is unknown, inconceivable, his conditioning. Unless. Unless what? Unless the corpsman himself was deficient, touched by chaos. At the sound of the word, Zane made a protective sign to the Aquila across her chest. They must be frightened sometimes, even soldiers. We are taught not to question. We are taught that the Emperor has all the answers, even when we are blind to them. We are taught that to think forbidden thoughts is a sign of insanity. But how? How can you know for sure? If I had to be shot at and blown up every day, and had to face all kinds of monsters, I think I'd be frightened. Not frightened. Ever muttered, never frightened. He wouldn't be drawn further on the subject. He didn't speak again until later that afternoon. They were clearing the site of a demolished hab block to allow a new one to be erected. They had overfilled a waste disposal cart, which Ava had to wheel to the incinerators. Zane went along. They volunteered to steady his load and shovel up any debris that slouched from it. What will you do? Ava asked her unexpectedly. She frowned. When? What do you mean? Once the reconstruction is complete. What did you do before? Zane laughed at him. <laughs> there is no before. Seeing Ava's brow furrow, she tried to explain. There is always rebuilding to do. We build, the traitors and the monsters come along, and knock everything down. And we have to build again. And this, the labor gangs. This is all there is. He was standing at the furnace mouth. Its breath seared the side of Zane's face and cast her friend in a fiery orange glow. We serve the Emperor if we build faster than enemies destroy. She was reciting old words again. Words she had learned in her scholar. When we built more than we need on Prius, we could send metal and chemicals to the Emperor's forges and men to fight for him. Then what? Evil thought better of the question, stifled it. He turned away, applying himself to the emptying of the cart. Zen had to prompt him twice before he looked at her again. What are those men fighting for? He asked in a deathly whisper. His eyes demanded an answer but she had none to give. Instead, to fill the uncomfortable silence, Zane blurted out, I knew him! He was our neighbor, back in the old hab block. He used to come around and fix our luma globes when they... I thought I should tell you. That's all. Avril didn't move. Didn't speak. Zane wondered if she had made a terrible mistake. There's no taking back the words, however. Not now she had finally released them. She couldn't bottle up her secret again. I knew the real Avro, she confessed. Avro returned to the shelter that night to find Zane's blanket gone. She had moved it as far away from him as she could. She avoided him at work too, though he kept an eye on her as much as possible. Only three days later did he find, and take, a chance to speak to her again. Zane looked tired. She had been lashed three times already. She was beginning to sag again, and whip servitors were circling. It took water over to her. Zane smiled weakly through the sheen of dirt that covered her round face. She was shivering. 
He felt her forehead. It was hot, and his hand came away damp. She let him help her dig until the servitors turned their gazes elsewhere. He was dead when I found him. He muttered to her. I didn't kill him. Zane gaped at him. Of course not. I never thought... He knew now why she alone had talked to him. Why she had been so curious. He owed her an explanation. For three days, he had striven to formulate one. I awoke and I was alone. He began interrupting her. I found his body. Avril's body. It, it, it may have been the blow to my head, but... I wondered why his life, your lives, were worth more than our lives. I wondered what you had that was so precious, worth the sacrifice of so many of my brothers. You thought too many questions. Avril nodded. Yes. I did. I wanted to understand. Uh, began Zane. She swallowed, averting her eyes from him. I have questions sometimes, too. Just in my mind, but... Go on, he said. Sometimes in the block, I'd hear people saying, Why can't we have more food and longer rest hours? I should have reported them as traitors, but I didn't. I knew they had alcohol. They were making it on the 34th floor. And there was graffiti in the stairwells, and the next thing anyone knew... Everything fell apart, muttered Avril. So, do you? Asked Zane with disarming directness. Do you understand? Avril's brow crisped. He took a breath. A sudden eruption of noise forestalled him. Familiar noise. The soundtrack of his old life. At first he thought it was in his head, another memory. Gunfire on the forces, rage and anger, fear and pain and explosions. He could see from Zane's face that she heard it too. In the distance, but rapidly approaching, the sound of war. Ever reached by reflex for a gun that wasn't there, he clung to the heft of his pickaxe instead, raising from his crouch. Most of the overseers had also drawn weapons and were headed towards the disturbance. The leader, Corporal Maxdill, remained. Ignore it! He barked at the numerous laborers, spraying spittle. Whatever is happening is no business of yours and no excuse for shrieking. This gang will meet its end of shift quota or I'll take the difference out of your hides. Sir, I can help. Avril spoke up. I he felt Zane's elbow in his ribs and bit his tongue. She was right. It'd be unwise to reveal his secret. A glowering servitor was pushing its way towards him. He did as he was told and returned to work. Though, not for long. The war with all its noise and fury crashed into them. It began with a single running figure, spitting profanities over his shoulder, a black and purple cultist cloak was slung over his grey laborer's coveralls. Max still fired. Missed. But a lasgun beam from behind blew out the traitor's knee. He fell in a spray of bone fragments and blood to lie in gasping, twitching agony. The corporal bowed into the inevitable, yelling to his gang to retreat, but keep hold of their tools. Avo kept a tight grip on his axe. More cultists burst into the scene, and he stepped to greet them. Not expecting resistance from a simple laborer, they ran into his bludgeoning attack. They were everywhere. Suddenly. Stinking shadows emerging from the half-light, seeking human shields to hide behind. One made a grab for Zane and earned Avril's pick through the skull. Muzzles flashed. Avril saw Maxdell cut down as he dived for cover. He pulled Zane down behind the half-demolished wall. One of the gang's lumen units was shot out, followed shiftly by others. Pious interior guard troops, including some of Avril's overseers, were hard on the cultists' heels. 
The last gun illuminated beams crisscrossed in darkness. Voices yelled to laborers to flatten themselves on their stomachs, but many were held captive or just too panicked to comply. The soldiers, having given their fair warning, were not resistant about shooting any shadows that moved. Zane had curled into a trembling ball. There are only a few of them, Avra whispered to her reassuringly. A dozen, most. This is not a planned attack. They've been smoked out of some bolt hole and are on the defensive. They're doing as much damage as they can. He could have added, but chose not to. One last howl of rage before they die. He recalled what Zane had said. We build, the traitors and monsters come along and to knock everything down. And we have to build again. Stay. Down. Evo knew his surroundings by instinct. He had committed every detail to them to memory. He also knew where each cultist had been when the lights went out. He edged out from behind the half wall, keeping low to reduce the risk of friendly fire. Some of the cultists could be pinpointed by the gibbering and shrieking. They were standing in trinity to the vile deity. Avril strained to block out their actual words. Words could be dangerous. He came up behind a likely shadow. He slipped his axe heft around its throat and strangled him with it. The cultists had no time to squeal. The fight left his limbs and he dropped. Avril was already seeking out his next target. A knot of figures crouched behind a barricade of Promethean barrels. Empty, thank the Emperor. They had two guns between them. The wielder's faces, twisted by insanity, lit up with each shot taken. In those flashes, Avril identified two other figures as cultists. Four more as cringing hostages, stealing up to the group. He interposed himself among them. Only one cultist saw him, shooting him a suspicious glare. Avril dropped his gaze as if cowed. Just one more hostage. The cultist he saw was not quite as unarmed as he had appeared to be. He was wearing a belt hung with grey metal eggs. At least four of them. Crack grenades. He was muttering to himself as if building his resolve. One last howl of rage before they die. In these urban surroundings with so many innocents, he would cause devastation. Avra had no choice. He lunged at the bombardier, driving a fist into his stomach. It took two more punches to extinguish the favor in his eyes. By then, his fellow decadents were alert to the enemy among them. Avril snatched a grenade and rounded on them. They weren't ready to die yet. After all, they shrank from him. For a second. Long enough for him to tackle the closest of them. He wrenched the cultists around into another sight as he fired. The cultist stiffened in Avril's arms and he threw the body into the others, at the same time wrenching the last gun from its deathly grip. The gun was local issue, lighter than Avril was accustomed to. It felt good to hold it. The same, like an extension of himself. His hands had felt empty for too long. He gunned down the remaining two cultists, unskilled combatants, with ease. Another ran up behind him, betraying his approach with a fanatical roar. They spun, not fast enough to bring his gun to bear, but in time to snap his attacker's jaw with its butt, driving bone through muscle. A wave of concussive force blew him over. Ever heard the explosion of a fraction of a second later. He stared down as flaming debris rained upon him. Another bomber. The blast had come from... He couldn't get his bearings. His right. We had left Zane. He rolled to put out any flames before they took hold. Smoke was smothering his oxygen, making him miss his gas mask, blinding him further, but concealing him too. The cultist with its back to Avril strafed the shadows with the las gun indiscriminately. Avril, in contrast, squeezed his trigger only once, punching through the target's head. Sensing movement to his left, he snapped his gun around, and a tier guard trooper had him in his sights. Nice work, thought Avril. He lowered his weapon and gestured to show he was an ally. The soldier held his fire. He motioned to Ever to get down on the ground anyway. Ever complied. 
Thank you for your service, citizen. The soldier grunted as he took the lasgun from him. We'll take it from here. Ivra waited, but seethed impatiently. There couldn't have been many cultists standing. He had down at least half of them himself, but the bombing had surely taken out some more. Still, long minutes passed, interpressed with brief but violent outbreaks of shouting, scuffled gunshots, before calm was restored. An Illumin unit had to be found and kicked into sputtering action. Interior guard troopers swept the area, prodding at every prostrate body, alive or dead, in search of enemies in hiding. At last, the survivors, the innocent laborers in Ava's gang, were given leave to stand. Doubtless next would come the order to return to work. As soon as Max Dill's replacement was established. In the meantime, they had precious moments to process what had happened, deal with their shock and count their dead. Some attacked their tormentors' bodies, hacking them with blunt tools or tearing them apart with bare hands. It was a pointless kind of revenge, other than to vent their misery and frustration. Nobody tried to stop them. Everyone made straight for the wall behind which he had left Zane. The wall had been sundered in the explosion. Zane's pale hand protruded in the debris, as if she had tried to claw her way to freedom before the breach was crushed out of her. Before the breath was crushed out of her. He took the hand between his own. It was already cold. He had seen so many deaths in his short life, he told himself. So very many. Why did this one feel different? Why was her life worth more than other lives? So do you. He recalled the very last thing Zane had said to him. Do you understand? Her last question, if her answered her aloud, as if there was a chance she might hear him. Yes, he whispered. I understand now. The sky was split by the shrieks of Imperial engines. Sergeant Yavrin looked up, shielding his eyes, as the first ships hit Prius atmosphere. Blazing gloriously, he shifted his gaze to the vast, straight lines of humanity stretched across the newly cleared assembly terrace on Hive Optis. Up a tear in his chest swelled with pride. He almost wished he was traveling to the stars with them. Almost. Of course, their departure would leave the labor gang short-handed, but this couldn't be helped. Prius Momentheus' tithe to the Imperium was due, and no allowance could be made for recent losses. The laborers who remained would have to work harder until the population was replenished. Jevon hadn't witnessed a tithing ceremony before. He had just been promoted, for the second time in less than four months after his predecessor was killed in a bombing attack. He strode along the endless ranks of men, pausing to question some. He asked their names and how they felt about being chosen to fight for the Emperor, to which all but one professed to be suitably honored. Suitably honored. That one gave his name as Evro. The name along with his pale, dull-eyed face almost sparked a flicker of recognition in Yevren. Begging your pardon, Sergeant, said the new recruit, but I was chosen to fight a long time ago. Yevren checked Avril's name on a status slate. So I see. The last draft overlooked you, so this time you volunteered for service. You achieved the highest scores in your intake in the selection test. The best scores I had ever seen, in fact. I know my life's purpose now, said Evro. You haven't raised an eyebrow. Pray tell. I was bred to fight and die for him. An admirable attitude. I shall face the Emperor's enemies. Therefore, 
Without fear or doubt, I shall exchange this life he has granted me for the greatest possible advantage to him. If I can only advance his cause in the slightest, then I shall consider my brief existence worthwhile. I shall do my duty. For what else is there, after all? What indeed? Evan smiled approvingly. He clasped his hands behind his back and moved on. The first of the dropships were coming in to land, to gather up its complacent of soon-to-be martyrs. Evan had forgotten most of their names already, but he would remember one name for a time. At least. But along with the question he had posed, the sergeant repeated it to himself in a thoughtful mutter. What else is there? Indeed. What else indeed? Woof. Bread to fight in war still continues on fighting in war anyways. <laughs> Just under a different name, that is. <laughs> now, now that is funny in a strange way. In my eyes, anyways. Hmm. I don't think I've read another uh, Krieg story like this before. Where the Death Kovsman was actually able to become free for a little bit. Quote unquote, free. <laughs> I'm going to update the uh, Patreon uh, end image after this video to go with everyone that's new, including someone's name that I have been uh, purposefully not saying at the end of the videos because the name they have for Patreon is... Uh, more questionable than the name Nicholas Gurr and Mike Hunt. Let me just uh, put that right there for everyone that's listening. And um, <clears throat> yeah, just, just let that sink into your mind and think about what would be a worse name to say than those two. <clears throat> ah. Anyways, let us say thank you to the ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. If you want to see videos before they even come out on YouTube, you can on the Patreon. It's been a thing for a while, I just never really brought it up because sometimes I am a lazy, uh, lazy boy, and I don't actually get the videos posted up even though they're done and ready. I normally post them day of, or like a day before, so it doesn't really work for the Patreon, so just like, hey, 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 hey here you go, everyone, ha-ha. <laughs> so I am going to be posting videos every Monday and Friday, or at least trying to this month. I'm going to be trying <laughs> really hard to do that. <clears throat> Without further ado, let us say thank you to the ongoing Patreon members of the channel. Nicholas Gurr. Fortis Unam, Ricky Brown, Mike Hunt, Caesar E. Lopez, Cocoa, Zach Keller Coffee, Meltdown 480, Eldrick Maldred, Mr. Cosman123, Lilac NPC, Starboard, Thompson, or Thompson, whatever you wish, 235, Azuth89, Joss Sickles, Angelo Nicholas, Matas and Jamin Davidson. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. If you want to be a Patreon support member of the channel, you can too in the link in the description down below. If I slurred any words during this whole entire audiobook, it's because I'm a little uh, sloshed, uh, haggard, whatever you want to say. <laughs> Only a little. I had uh, two shots before doing this whole entire recording, which was a bad idea. And it only started affecting me during the recording, because the whole entire time I'm thinking, 
Hey, yo, I could record this whole thing. I'm fine. I'm chill. I'm, I'm doing this up. You know what I mean, homeboy? Uh... First word in for reading the title sequence. The whole entire uh, book shifted one way and warped another. I'm thinking, am I being teleported to another dimension? No, it was... um. It was the drink taking full effect. I am completely slightly sober now, but I will be uh, going to bed now. So, I'm going to sleep. If you fell asleep during this, let me know in the comment section down below. Those are very interesting comments to read for me. I, I genuinely like reading comments about, Hey, yo, I fell asleep during this. Could you please keep it on the low down for when you're going to yell? Or if you're going to be loud, I want to sleep. Or you're just listening to this on the car ride, at work, in the mines. Whatever. What are you doing while listening to this? You're painting some new models. What are you working on? What's going on out there in your world? I want to know. Maybe I can give you some guidance for um, modeling or if you're doing a customized job for something or a model or you're working on a car i don't know cars i i don't know machines or mechanic stuff i'm pretty stupid like this <laughs> yeah yeah anyways i'm talking too much good morning good afternoon good night whatever it is i stole this from the truman show no, honestly, I, I, I just started saying it without realizing, because I've never actually seen the movie until just a few days ago. And now I'm thinking, oh, people probably think I'm doing this on purpose or jokingly. I, I originally wasn't, because I don't know what time you're going to listen to the video, because for some people in the world, it's morning, some it's afternoon, and some it's nighttime, like where I'm at. So, um... I just wanted to get everyone involved in this one. So, um, yeah, it's, it wasn't originally the Truman Show. It was um, my own desire to say hello to everyone. Or goodnight, whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> it's only after watching the movie I went, Oh. Oh. Huh. Anyways, hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, let me know in the description, the, the comment section down below. And what else you'd like to see from the channel. If you have any fanfics you want me to read, post it in the comment section down below. You know, bring up that community up a little bit more. The attention, give me those clicks and views and likes and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. You, you can't see me doing the cowboy yeehaw movements. <laughs> I'm doing the southern yeehaw. <laughs> uh, uh, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed the video. I'll be seeing you in the next one. Good night.